If you look at the evolution of the pipe organ through history, what you'll find is that the finest builders, the ones that we regard as being the best of the best today, were the ones that were not limited uh, to the pipe organ, but loved music in general. Because to consider the pipe organ as outside the musical mainstream is to do it a disservice. It's really to be understood in context how it relates to music making in general. Uh, it is possible, of course, to build a pipe organ and not really care about any other kind of music making except organ music. But you get the most versatile instruments and you get the most inspired organ building when you understand the pipe organ in terms of being uh, a musical instrument unique unto itself and yet not so far out of the mainstream that it's in outer space. Many people think that because the organ has 12 and a half thousand pipes, more or less, that that means it's a very loud instrument. Well, it can be very loud, but it, it doesn't have a lot of pipes to be loud. It has a lot of pipes so that the range of colors that it can express are, can be very diverse. So it has some ensembles that have very powerful development. It also has many, many, many soft, and ravishing, and beautiful sounds that are suitable for reproducing orchestral transcriptions. The, uh, the, the organ has had three distinct personalities, uh, each identified with the builder that was in, in control at the time. The Hutchings instrument was in many ways revolutionary. Uh, that instrument, while it was probably a little radical for Hutchings, was pretty typical of what Hutchings was doing overall. The 1915 rebuild by the Steer Company was a little bit different because that was the, the height or the peak of the, uh, the foundational concept in organ building. when emphasis was placed on the eight-foot tone and the variety of eight-foot tone as opposed to the uh, development of the ensemble with upper work and mixtures and so forth. Steer organ was uh, a very successful instrument. The chassis of the steer organ is still here by and large. The steer organ used uh, quite a lot of the Hutchings pipes, uh, but when in 1928-29 the Skinner Company rebuilt the organ, uh, most of the steer pipes uh, were removed and all of the Hutchings pipes that were kept by steer were retained by Skinner. Some of the steer pipes were retained by Skinner, but mostly the ensemble of the Newberry organ in 1928 took a, a radical turn more towards the English sound that Harrison sought to bring to America and that Skinner wanted here. So much of what we know about the evolution of this instrument in the Skinner rebuilding of it is anecdotal, and all of the players are gone. Uh, their voices are forever silent now. Uh, so you, it depends on who you talk to and what they heard and what they remember and what agenda they bring to the stories. But near as I can tell, uh, Harrison, again, was brought by Arthur Hudson Marks, supposedly to be Skinner's assistant. Skinner was very happy about that because Harrison was the key to all the English secrets that Skinner wanted to incorporate in his instruments. But after only a, a few years, it was evident to Mr. Skinner that Harrison was brought not to be his assistant, but to be his replacement. And that started tensions between the two men. Those tensions were uh, uh, unfolding while this instrument was in the design and finishing process. It, it wasn't so simple as a, a shouting match. Uh, it was a gradual, uh, um, if you will, uh, a gradual shift in the power of the company from what Mr. Skinner wanted to what Mr. Harrison wanted. One of the tensions between the two men 
was that some of the new contracts coming into the company specified Mr. Harrison would be responsible for the design and finishing. Skinner, who had built the company up from nothing, naturally bristled at this. And probably at first he felt a mild sense of resentment, but when this began to happen with more regularity, understandably he was not amused. Was not ready to step down and retire. Uh, Harrison was uh, told, I'm sure, by Marx, that he was going to come to the company to run it. Uh, he probably had very uneasy relationships with Mr. Skinner. On the one hand, Mr. Skinner being a generation older than Harrison, Harrison would accord him some respect. After all, this was Mr. Skinner's company, but Mr. Skinner didn't own the company anymore. It was owned by Mr. Marx. And Harrison had been, I'm sure, told that this company would one day be his. So while Harrison uh, probably never ac actively sought to take control from Mr. Skinner, it happened as it would happen. Marx saw to it that it would happen, mm -hmm. and, uh, and the two men did quarrel. At the point when the Newberry organ was designed and finished, tonally finished, uh, the men were still getting along. Uh, we find letters between the university uh, and both Mr. Skinner and Mr. Harrison. Uh, Harrison was responsible for some as aspects of the design. Skinner was responsible for other aspects of the design. The earlier letters in uh, back and forth with the university to Mr. Jepson were from Skinner. But as the process wore on, they were increasingly from Harrison. And uh, uh, you can see this, this shift uh, ha taking place during the course of the installation of this organ. Um, it's one of the things that I've noticed over my years is that, yes, the, the, the hardware is interesting. Uh, all these odd-shaped pipes and the mechanism and the, and the, uh, the air pressure and the, all the stuff that impresses the casual visitor. But in the end, it's not only about the hardware. It's about the human beings connected with the hardware. Their personalities are poured out on this hardware. And in most cases, the church organs that were the result of, of these personalities have been largely lost and altered. They've been replaced or changed. And with that alteration of the hardware, so goes some of the story. One of the fascinations of the Newberry is that it's pretty much as it was left. And so the vibes in this instrument are extremely powerful. It is the, the synthesis of the hardware and the human story that for me is the fascination of this work.